there's uh, three specification tests that you need to do when you're dealing with endogeneity. <clears throat> the first one is, do you really have a, an endogeneity problem at all? Right? So you, it may well be that theoretically there could be uh, endogeneity, you know, that is, you, you don't know what causes what. But in practice, when you actually do the test, it, you know, it, it isn't really a concern. Yeah? So here, the test to see whether you have endogeneity or not is something called the Hausman Wu test. Yeah? So the next two specification tests examine whether you've got good instruments for loss or not. Right? So two things you want to check. Is the instrument associated with the endogenous, endogenous variable? That is, you want the instrument to be correlated with the thing that you're measuring uh, that you consider is endogenous. And are the instruments uncorrelated with the error? So they're the two conditions. Instrument uncorrelated with the error, but the instrument is uh, correlated with the endogenous variable. You want to check those two. The Hausman Wu test is the hypothesis is that uh, OLS, you know, the maximum likelihood, is a normal test, right? Is before you're accounting for endogeneity, is fine, so it's efficient and consistent. However, the alternative is that it's not fine and that you need the, 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 um, the parameters estimated by instrumental variables to get consistent estimates. So the way you test it is you take the parameters you estimated under OLS, uh, and from that you take away the, the estimate, the parameters you estimated on instrumental variable. Yeah, and you square what how big is that difference? You know, how big is that difference? This is significantly different. And of course, you weight that by the variance covariance matrix of the difference of these two things. So what's the difference in the parameters that you estimate for instrumental variables estimation and OLS estimation? And you weight that by uh, the variance covariance matrix, basically the standard error. Yeah? And uh, you, you square that. And that's a chi-squared. And the degrees of freedom is given by the number of elements in the in your parameters, the number of parameters that you estimate. So it's actually quite a simple test uh, to implement. Uh, how do you tell if your uh, instruments are correlated with your endogenous variable? Well, you regress your endogenous variable on the instrument. Yeah. And so then you check the R squared and the F, right? So really the rule of thumb is you need the F of this regression to be greater than 10. Right? So that's the rule of thumb. And then more uh, formal tests are given by Stock and Yoga and Kleber, uh, Bergen and Pat. Yeah? So we can look up tables and there's more analytic tests. And then what about how do you test that the uh, instruments are in parallel with the error? Well, here's the instrument and here's the error. Here's the instrument and here's the error. If you over-identify uh, this equation, so you have some more equations, we might have x2 minus 1, x1 minus uh, uh, x, x1 t minus 1, and so on, you'll have an, a test for over-identifying uh, restriction. So that's the main statistical approach, right? And you know, how do you come up with the instruments, right? Is a very important uh, question. And so the editors are very interested in it. Uh, you could use, like we've been doing so far, the exogenous variables that appear elsewhere in the system. That is, we instrumented the Y1 and Y2 with X1 and X2. We made the, um, you know, the assumption that the Ys were endogenous and the Xs were exogenous. Uh, another way to do it is lag values of the endogenous variables. And you can see that we did that in the different GMM and we did that in the system GMM. However, you could come up with economically uh, meaningful and intuitive instruments, right? And the uh, editors really liked it. Yeah? So, uh, one of these guys, Ang Angriff, yeah? he's one of the Nobel Prize winners, right? So, his instrument way back, right, was. Uh, a random lottery draw. In the US, when you got called up to the Vietnam War, they randomly drew uh, birthdays. Yeah. So, and uh, you think the random draw of your birthday would be correlated with uh, you know, earnings uh, you know, 20 years later. Well, uh, it shouldn't be, right? So that, 
that sounds like the, the instrument is unparalleled with the, the error. However, is you know, whether your birthday come up, is that correlated with whether you went to the Vietnam War or not? Well, yes, it is, right? Because normally, if your, um, your birthday come up randomly, you would go to the war. However, not everyone did. For example, George Bush, you know, because his father was a famous man, George Bush Jr. didn't go to the Vietnam War, right? His father was able to get him in the National Guard. So there's enough situations like that where some people whose birthday come up didn't go to the Vietnam War, but it was highly correlated with whether they went to the Vietnam War. So that is considered uh, a good instrument, and you see that Anchor got the Nobel Prize. So a, a, a colleague of mine, Casper Nielsen, came up with this uh, instrument, and this is my favorite, right? That the sex of the firstborn was used as an instrument in determining uh, whether family succession affect firm performance. So first of all, what are the two properties of an instrument? Yeah. So you know, something random that happens, the sex of, of the firstborn, will that affect uh, you know, firm performance, say, 40 years or 50 years from now? Right? It's a random thing that happened 40 or 50 years that shouldn't affect firm performance, firm performance now. So it's independent of the error. Okay. The second thing we've got to check is, is the sex of the firstborn is that going to be correlated with family succession yeah. in the firm? Well, think about it. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately, um, this, if the child happens, the first one happens to be a male, then it turns out then it's more likely that you will have a family succession, right? Where the father will pass on the firm to the son. Yeah. And that's more likely than it's the uh, the, the child or the girl. So that is like a brilliant instrument because it's uncorrelated with uh, performance 40 or 50 years from now, but it is correlated with whether there's going to be family succession or not. Uh, other instruments that people have used, uh, these two are probably the best, the first two. Top managers prior military service can be used as a uh, proxy for disclosure quality. Uh, marginal tax weight as a proxy for leverage and education for an instrument and determining the effect of family succession. So that's possible, right? If you went to Yale and Wharton, uh, you set up for a you know, career in a business, whether you're male or female, that might affect uh, whether it's a family succession. So, you know, it's, these are, you know, the best ones I can come up with. So there's not even, uh, you know, not even half a dozen there, right? Uh, the one I really like the most is uh, the, the second one, uh, and but people use the first one. Outside of the one and two, it's really, really hard to come up with a good instrument. Right? So you can try coming up with a good instrument, and the editors will love that. Uh, so you can see where the papers are published, American Economic Review, Broadly Journal of Economics, Accounting Review, Journal of Man, uh, American Economic Review. So you can see that you know if you can come up with a really good instrument that the editors uh, like that and they publish a paper in the peer one journal, but you can also see how difficult it is. 